I'm going to read to you from Matthew 18, 23 to 35, message version, which sometimes says these things a lot better. I love its street nature language that it has. And it says, the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. As he got underway, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of $100,000. He couldn't pay. So the king ordered the man to, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the entire debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him ten dollars. He seized him by the throat and demanded he pay up now. The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. But he would not do it. He had him arrested and put in jail until the debt was paid. When the other servants saw this going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summoned the man and said, you evil servant, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you feel compelled to be merciful to your servant, to your fellow servant who asked you for mercy? The king was furious and put the man to the screws until he paid the entire debt back. That's exactly what my father in heaven is going to do to each one of us who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. The context of this, you may recall, um, is Jesus is answering with this idea of what the kingdom's like, this parable, this metaphor, this insight, because Peter said, how many times should we forgive someone that hurts us? And he said... Um, as many as seven, as if that was an impressive number, I think. I imagine the tone. Many as seven? And Jesus like, try 70 times seven. Now, the Pharisees, the religious people, would do the math and make it 490. Assuming that what he meant was there is a limit, after all, on forgiveness and mercy. So, when you get to 490, you're out. And with some people, you could use 490 up quickly. Could be a day with your children. <laughs> so Jesus is telling this story in response to the question about how many times should we forgive people that hurt us. And Jesus is kind of making the point that forgiveness isn't about quantity. It's about quality. That really if forgiveness is done right, you should only ever do it once. And if you forgive someone once, you'll realize that the gift of that is more to you than to them. And to repeatedly forgive means you never forgave properly, I suppose, in the first place. And I'm not pretending forgiveness is an easy or cheap thing. But I think the point he's making is forgiveness isn't a moral issue. It's an energy issue. <laughs> That if you don't forgive, the energy that requires from you to sustain that hatred, to sustain your offense, is going to wear you out and rob you of your life. So to forgive once is an energy-saving exercise, isn't it, when you think about it that way? And I think Jesus is as much saying that as anything else. But I digress a wee bit and want to get you to my magic show. Because he's talking about what the kingdom of God is like. He said the kingdom of God is like. When Jesus says that, we have to figure out as readers and students and communicators of Scripture, which part of this does he mean? Which part of this is the kingdom like? Is the kingdom like all of it? Do we overthink it? Do we get into the minutiae of the text? Some would do that. I think what he's saying in the kingdom of God is like the primary principles at play in the scenario is what he expects us to take from this. He says the kingdom of God is like a merciful king 
ruling over a kingdom of forgiven people who should be outraged when some amongst them don't pass that on. Isn't that fair? He's saying the kingdom of God is like a merciful king ruling over a kingdom of scoundrels of forgiven people of debtors of people that couldn't pay we all owed what we couldn't pay so he's ruling over a king the king of like a king that's ruling over a kingdom whose subjects whose citizens all of us no exception all of the citizens of the kingdom all of us are ex-offenders we're all people that couldn't pay and should have been thrown in jail but when we looked to him for forgiveness and for mercy he forgave us but but the kingdom is also like other servants in the kingdom who see when one of their own does not forgive someone else like they were forgiven and the job of the rest of the servants the rest of the subjects our job is to be outraged when you know someone that has been forgiven like you have that does not pass it on don't forget that bit about what the king is like what happened to outrage in the church we've been outraged about all the wrong stuff that God didn't even care about but the kingdom is like a population that at its core has an outrageous streak because they're outrageously forgiven and are outraged when one amongst them does not do that and the title of this message and I'll bring you to the magic show is love is not a gift love is not a gift it's a baton mercy love forgiveness grace kindness acceptance all of these we could say are expressions of this all of those are component parts of being a loving human being but I want you to understand what is at the core of this story Jesus tells is this idea that love is not one of these this is more girly isn't it this present yeah it's too feminine to give to a man <laughs> so I'm gonna give it to you love is not one of those love is one of these what's not love is when I decide that this belongs to me who do these belong to think about a race who do these belong to they don't belong to the runners these this idea and the reason I've got props and I don't always use props or use them well because it's like multitasking for me <laughs> the reason I wanted to bring these two props is that you that learn visually better than audibly will remember these props more than you remember the content of my speaking and that will be a good takeaway because I want you to always from tonight onwards this doesn't mean that you don't already know this but this is a refresh I want you from tonight onwards to always think of love as one of these and if you think of it as one of these and not one of them you can't possibly hoard this you can't possibly take it home because it doesn't make sense the people in the race that handle this don't take it home nor do they bring it with them because we are carriers 
and passers of the baton. We are not keepers and protectors of it. But we have been. We have been for generations. Our church was for 20 years. We sang about passing love on in the lyrics of our songs and in the language of our prayers and preaching. I think we were, we were passing this on in our virtual reality. In the flight simulator of church life, we were passing this on. But there was nobody different coming to our church to the people that were already there. You know why? Because we decided, we decided we get to choose who we pass this to. So we don't pass it to people of a different color. We don't pass it to people from a different side of the tracks to us. We don't pass it to youth or elderly. We don't pass it to drug addicts or homeless people or prostitutes or homosexuals or we, 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 we only pass it to people we feel comfortable passing it to because we don't want people to be involved in our world. And if we pass them love, they might think we're permitting them to be in our world. So let's be careful. And I want you to know that selective baton passing is as bad as not passing. You know, you know the people... You know, the people in the relay race don't get to decide, oh, I don't want to pass it to you. I, I, I prefer him. <laughs> or you know what? I'm just going to keep it and run, keep running. The race is over. Everybody's disqualified. If the runners hold on to this, everybody's disqualified. Not just the one that's holding it. Everybody suffers. When you don't pass this on, when you don't pass love on, this whole church suffers. Just imagine, and this is only a fraction of your church, but just imagine if this was the entire church here tonight. Just imagine if every single one of you decided from tonight onwards, you will see love differently. You will stop receiving love as a gift that stops with you. It's mine, my precious. <laughs> you will stop protecting it, warehousing it, holding it. Cherishing it, admiring it, loving it, showing it off, taking pride in it, finding your identity in it. If you would go home from tonight and decide, I am going to be a passer of the baton of love. And you may not feel very loved, but if you feel at all that God has forgiven you anything at all, then you are already indebted to this king. You're already one of these scoundrels that have been forgiven. And whatever you feel, every degree to which you feel you've been forgiven, I want you to go home from tonight and start passing this on. It might start with a text you have to send to someone tonight. It might start with a phone call. It might start with being kind to someone that you have not been kind to. It might just be a simple act that no one notices, no one celebrates didn't make any big difference on its own, but it cost you a lot. Because maybe it's in the direction of someone you have not passed this on to for a long time. But I've got to tell you, if you don't pass this on, it's not neutral. It doesn't just, it's not okay. And it's not enough that we're up here preaching about love and the heart of God and you say amen, but in your heart you are harboring love. And you are not passing it on, or you are selective in who gets it, or you are delayed in passing it on, or you're making your mind up. This is not an easy message. This is not easy for us to do. I, I'm, I'm sitting where you're sitting in my mind when I do these messages. <laughs> there are some people that I don't want to pass this on to. I want them to feel what it's like to not be loved, to not be included, because maybe they made you feel that way. So I get why this becomes difficult for us to pass on, but love has to be passed on. See that lady's face? 
You still got it? It's to pass on. Keep passing it on. Uh, you had one job. <laughs> and so into this unforgiving world comes Jesus. And what they hated about him was that his love was out of control. He did not care who was permitted by the religious status quo to be loved and not loved. And we all know, don't we, that he opens his massive heart and he suddenly includes people that the church were not including. This was our church. We included people in our circle of love that we felt were safe and we felt that we would not be overstretched and overdemanded and inconvenienced by. And so we had our own version of passing love, but we were passing kind of between us. And Jesus comes into the midst of that kind of scenario, which is true for many churches around the world that have become, that have become sippers and connoisseurs of love, that have become backseat drivers and critics of love. And if they don't feel that the love is right or the love is enough or the love is served in the way that they prefer and like, they write letters to the pastor or they leave saying there's no love in this church because they have no awareness, no allowance for the nature of this love. So when I got outraged with our church, I was outraged with myself and our church because I was part of creating the problem of our inward lookingness. I want to realize 20 years in that we had been loving ourselves and we'd been warehousing love, that we had been holding on to love. I realized that this was our greatest crime, if you like, and, and, and I wasn't outraged. And I remember getting a phone call around that time from the minister's fraternal in the city. Every city has one. Watch out for them. <laughs> Sounds very posh and something like you want to be part of, but it normally isn't. The minister's fraternal contacted us and invited us to be part of the minister's fraternal, uh, but they wanted something from me. And they said, um, we would love you to come and attend our meeting this week. They'd never contacted me before. I've been in the city 20 years. They said, because um, I don't know if you know or not, but the Circus of Horrors is in town. And we are, we are getting a protest march of all of the Christians in the city we had more Christians in our church than they did, so I think they're borrowing our strength like churches sometimes do from your church. So would you get your people mobilized? We're going to take placards. We're going to, and the Circus of Horrors was a big top tent that had pitched in the middle of our city in a park area. And it was, a circus, it was called Circus of Horrors. And it was like, you know, it was like a, a circus ring, but it was kind of based on kind of horror. So all the actors were like dressed up as vampires and chainsaw massacre people and all this stuff, you know, the horror, the gore, all the, all the prosthetics and all the sort of special effects of exploding heads and blood everywhere. That's the kind of vibe of the Circus of Horrors. And it's in our city. So they're contacting me to come and get involved in marching against the Circus of Horrors. And he said, come and rely on your support. And I said, no way. He said, what do you mean? This is so important. This is a disgrace we have this in our city. I said, listen, why would I waste my and our people's time? Why would you waste your people's time in protesting against a Circus of Horrors that will leave town tomorrow when the real Circus of Horrors that will never leave our city, you have never called me about once. I said, when we, when we drove our vehicles down into the red light district to reach the prostitutes, I don't recall being in a queue behind your vehicle. And we should have been. I said, there's no competition for those people because we're all trying to steal each other's people. I said, I wish when I went to feed the homeless that we had to get in a line behind all the other churches that had beat us to it. But when we found the homeless, there was no churches to be seen. Isn't that the circus of horrors in our town that we should all be outraged about? Well, of course, he was very offended. Um, said a few unkind things to me that confirmed what he felt about the arrogance of our church. 
and never invited me to the, to the fraternal again, for which I was very happy. <laughs> but that's my point, that for, for generations we're outraged about stuff that God doesn't even care about. And the stuff that God does care about, we were indifferent to. Where's the baton gone? Who's got the baton? No, no, wave it for me. Is it back there? Fantastic. It's got right to the back row. Keep it moving. <laughs> See? Watch this now. Where's the present? <laughs> it's where I left it. That's my point. Because who's going to give away that beautiful package? You ain't going to pass that on. Are you? If I come to you and love takes that form, then I come to you and, and, and give it to you like it's the most precious, fragile, beautiful gift in the world. And it's just for you, and I love you, and I'm for you, and there, there, there. <laughs> then we kind of feel it, it stops with us. It's for me. I need that. You know, and don't get me wrong, some of you in here, there are many people that are not here tonight that want to be here or not sure whether or not they'd be welcome because they think the church is this instead of a passer on of love. Some of you in here tonight have needed a lot of love in your life. There are people not here tonight that are desperate for lack of love in their life. So I understand how it feels like a gift when you've had none. I understand how mercy and forgiveness feels like a massive relief, a gift, when you've had none. And this is the point that Jesus is making, that the kingdom of, the kingdom of God is, is like people that have been forgiven this massive amount, and the least of that should be that we don't hold it, we don't think that that is where the kingdom stops. And I've got to tell you, if you want to see God mad, not a lot of stuff makes God mad. If you want to see God get angry, then just don't pass love on. Few things make God angry. This is why Jesus cursed the fig tree. He's not having a bad day and needs a sabbatical talking to trees. He gets angry with this tree because it had no figs on it. But it's a fig tree with no figs. So he curses the fig tree. Nothing happens. Then the next day when they return their journey and go past the fig tree, it's withered up from the roots. What is, what is all that about? It's Jesus saying that the fig tree is a living violation of its creational mandate. Its creational purpose is to receive and pass on. So is ours. It is not just our creational mandate that was given to Adam and Eve to fill the earth and to bless the world. That was all of humanity's original mandate. But if we forgot it, it is restored in our relationship with Christ. When we enter into a new beginning with him, that whole mandate comes again to the fore. So it's both for us a creational mandate and a redemptive mandate. We double responsible in the church for passing love on and so Jesus curses the fig tree because it's using up the soil and it's demanding attention and it's taking in the elements and enjoying the rain and the sun but it's not producing fruit so he curses it because it's a metaphor it's a picture of the state that the church was in in his generation it's still a metaphor about much of the church around the world and 98 percent of our population in England and Europe are not in church and are anti-church and I don't blame them because we have, not, we have not done this to the church. We have done, we've done this to the world. We've not done that to the world. We've not gone with open hearts and open arms. We have more come across like this. And I get why so many can't come here, can't be in our churches because they don't feel the love. And I want to ask you to take away from tonight that you will commit afresh to be a passer of the baton 
that you will not hold it another day, that you will not warehouse, that you will not make it about you, that you don't make this church about you. And one of the things you're blessed in with your leaders, and this matters too in churches, because sometimes our style as leaders is making the problem worse. Jesus tells an interesting parable, and we won't turn to it for time, but but you ought to make a note of it because you won't believe it's in the Bible because it's one of these obscure ones that you don't read. Nobody mentions this parable when we're talking about the parables, but it's in Luke 13 where Jesus tells a story about a man, a gardener, that had a vineyard and a fig tree was in the vineyard. But the fig tree wasn't producing any fruit. So the owner of the garden comes to the gardener and says, hey, I've been coming here for three years to check out the welfare, the productivity of the vineyard. And this fig tree has never produced any figs. You need to cut it down. It shouldn't be using up the soil. And the gardener says to the owner, you know what, I, I know, uh, hey, I'm working on it. Give me another year. I'll dig around it. I'll fertilize it. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure next year we get something from it. So the gardener puts up a case to justify the non-fruitfulness of the tree that has had a lot of attention. And I want you to know that the most successful, progressive, thriving churches are not led by gardeners. They're led by people with an owner mentality. Because owners are concerned with productivity and return for amount of labor put in ratio. All progressive companies, all corporates, all people that know that the bottom line is about return for investment. Our world would not exist. We would not have the infrastructures that we do. We would not have companies like Apple and others that we take for granted. These massive corporates, we would not have them had they said, you know what, it doesn't really matter about a profit or a return. Let's just keep giving stuff away, churning stuff out. And churches that are led by people with a garden mentality and gardeners are obsessed with plant welfare and owners are not. Gardeners have a cutoff point. Uh, owners have a cutoff point. Gardeners don't. So this guy's asking for a fourth year. The owner says it's been three years. And the gardener says, let's go another year. And the owner's like, let's pluck it up because it has no right to take up the time and the attention and the effort but it's getting, and I built a church where we give massive disproportionate effort and time to overfed, under-exercised under Christians <laughs> that just believed, it, that believed that they were entitled to all this time from our pastoral care team. And we'd spend hours and hours and weeks and months loving and helping and serving these people. I'd be awake at night worrying about them while they were fast asleep. Then they'd leave saying, there's no love in this church. I'm like, what? <laughs> and you are blessed here because your leaders are, have an ownership mentality and you should not be upset or offended by that because you need to have that with your kids and with your relationships and with where you work. You need to have this, hey, by now. We should be seeing some return, some, some resolve, some movement, some growth, some, some development, some, some response from all this time we're putting in because this is, and in this picture, God is a picture, God is embodied in the owner. God is not the gardener in this picture. He's the owner coming to the gardener. And this is the owner's mentality. And this is my mentality as a pastor and a leader for the last 20 years, but not the first 20 because I was a gardener for the first 20 and it nearly killed me trying to fertilize and dig around people that never had any intention of growing any figs. It's exhausting. And I changed to become an owner. And I'm like, no, I won't see you. No, we're not going to counsel you. No, I'm done with giving you time because I'm realizing these are the time wasters that are stopping us passing love on because they're warehousing it and they're consuming it and they're treating it as a gift and an entitlement and I'm exhausted pouring all my love into unproductive people because we didn't see love was a baton because we keep pouring into the same people and it parks itself up. Where's the baton gone? Where is it? 
Well, it's getting around, eh? Where's the present? Thank you. <laughs> because the owner's mentality is this. This is, this, is, this is proper leadership mentality, okay? You don't want your pastor to not be a leader. These churches are not growing. It's impossible for a church to grow if the pastor is not, is, does not have a leadership gift because pastors, by definition, without that leadership edge, are gardeners. They're addicted to you thriving. And if you don't thrive, pastors take it personal. Because pastors are hardwired for retention. We feel if you're not thriving, it's our fault. So we try harder. And if you leave the church, we're like, oh, it's my fault. I didn't love them enough. Especially if they're right and tell you that. It's because you didn't love us. You never called us back. It's the way you looked at me. You all okay? I'll, I'll be out of town soon. Don't worry about it. I'm not, I'm not your pastor, so hold on the letter, okay? Write it to him. The, the owner's mentality is this. And, and this needs to be ours and yours. Where you pass your love around. Listen. His mentality says, if everything in the garden is growing and the fig tree is not, the problem's not the garden. The problem's not the soil. If I have five kids and feed them all the same food and four of them flourish and one of them doesn't, the problem's not the food. There's something wrong with that child. The food's not helping that child because there's something in that child's physiology. That means that we have a problem because everybody else is thriving. And, 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 and for generations, pastors keep changing the menu because one or two people aren't thriving, as if it's their fault. It may well be that, that they are obese with love. They have love obesity. I just invented that in my head right now. That's a post right there. Love obesity. Are you suffering from love obesity? What, what? Are you so loved up that you can hardly stand it anymore? If so, you are living full, staying full, and protecting your fullness. And that was never the intention of God for his people. Where's the baton? It's gone full circle. I love it. Where's the present? I know. I know that line's getting tired now, but maybe I'll do it one more time. Then I'll leave you alone. I wonder if the outcome for tonight would be a good outcome that you would leave here and ask yourself, am I a hoarder of love? Do I see it as a gift? Or do I see it as something that I must pass on? Because we're dealing here with the very DNA. We're dealing with the very nature of love here. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like, and he's describing He's describing what mercy is like, that mercy, that mercy doesn't end with anyone, that mercy is not mercy unless it's in motion. Love is not love unless it is being passed around, and grace isn't grace, and kindness isn't kindness if it's not being passed around. There's something about it, it goes off. It gets past a cell by date. It starts to smell off, and many churches smell off. Because they're warehousing stuff and stockpiling stuff and not passing it on. It's passing love on that keeps the church fresh. It's giving stuff away that keeps us fresh and keeps God interested. But when we hoard it and hold it with anything you hold and hoard that was meant to be kept in the cycle of life, these things were meant to be in the cycle of life. And when it stops, whenever these things stop, Around that place where it stops, all manner of weirdness and dysfunction happens in humanity. Entire countries, entire governments are stockpiling and hoarding and warehousing wealth and stealing it from the people. And the country is dying through abject poverty and the leaders are billionaires. Because they're not passing on. They came to government to fill their own pockets, to take care of their own futures and families, and don't pass it on. They've got bank accounts all around the world, and their people are starving. 
So entire countries are guilty of this idea, let alone churches. This is something in humanity. Humanity do not see grace and love and kindness and blessing and prosperity and good fortune. They do not see it as something to pass on. Because I've got to keep it in case I lose it, in case I'll be without. And if you've come from a poverty, lack, malnourished background, you are malnourished of love and kindness. Then the moment you get some, you grab it and hold it. This makes relationships weird. It makes marriages weird and friendships weird. Because one of them, one of them in the marriage is a spender and one is a hoarder. One gives away love and hospitality and kindness. And the other one is shut down and closed because of past and history and damage. And it's true of the world. And so... I don't think just because you're in a good progressive church that this isn't worthwhile talking to you about. Because I've got to tell you, we don't default to, we don't default to this. We, we always default to comfort and love and attention. So we don't default to baton. We default to present. Where's the baton? Where is it? Somebody nicked it, eh? Uh, where is it? It's there. Yay. Who's got it now? Okay, stand up. You have the start of the baton. Stand up. Stand up. You have the baton. What's your name? Rachel. Rachel, that baton looks beautiful in your hand. It's red. Sets off your outfit well. Suits you well. Love looks good on you. But you've got to pass it on, love. Ah. Uh -huh.